Okay, point two. There are many tools out there, right? And we like tools. And, and we have people who do tools well. Eh? And we have conflict assessment tools galore. I'm sure many of you have gone, been trained in them and used them from precisely Mary Anderson's Do No Harm and many, many other on. Some of you, I'm sure, have a professionally lucrative job doing those tools. Eh? So do I, for that matter, at times. And the same holds for the right side. At the right side as well, we have good tools. But recently, I was talking to uh, Diana Chigas, who also works actually for Anderson's Outfit, and they had done a big research project um, in, in um, Kosovo, Macedonia? <laughs> Kosovo, with a whole bunch of organizations looking at the tools they had used and the programming that came out of it. And fascinatingly enough, there was not the faintest relation between the two i.e. some organizations had really used tools well, smartly, debated well, written good policy papers, and yet their projects in nothing reflected any of this particular knowledge. Other organizations had done nothing and had gorgeously fine-tuned conflict-sensitive projects. There was statistically zero relation between the two. And it would not surprise me if this were the exact same with rights-based tools as well. Uh, that there is, as, as it stands now, almost no relation between the use of the tool and the actual outcome. And they don't necessarily explain how that comes, I think. To them, it's still a question as well. And to me, too. I have evaluated agencies who did nothing and who did a great job, who did nothing in terms of using tools, and yet did a fine job, and vice versa. And so clearly, one of the key challenges inside our organizations must be something about, what do you do with knowledge? Right? How do you get knowledge to stick and to be operationally relevant to yourself? And I imagine that this may be also one of the topics on the table for the next uh, couple of days, um, because it's not solved. Number three, what does that one say? Yeah, I think that there are some major limitations in the rights-based approaches themselves, which are particularly severely felt in a post-conflict uh, context. Um, for example, one of the things that is really bothersome about rights-based approaches and human rights advocates in general, apart from their painfully obnoxious high moral ground, is, is their incapacity to deal with issues of resources. Right? It is as if resource constraints never exist. Eh? It's only political will. If things happen, if rights are violated, it must be evil people in power who make this happen. Right? And hence, these evil people in power must be told what to do right, because, of course, being evil and stupid most of the time, I guess, simultaneously, they need to be forced into this. But the fact that there m might be resource constraints that are real, that the knowledge and the people and the money really isn't out there to make many of these things happen, and that hence these things happen for a reason, potentially, at least in part, is, is very hard to deal with from a rights perspective. It's actually basically impossible to deal with from a rights perspective because it would mean that you would have to start trading them off or making choices about which ones to kind of drop for the moment. But it is clear that, to take Burundi again, even if we had in power a government that was solely and exclusively committed morning to night about making rights happen for people, both political and economic, political and uh, ones, and economic and social ones, even if the government wanted to do that. And admittedly, it doesn't. But even if it did, it could not. There is no possible way it could even make one single one entirely happen for its full population as it stands. The right to food. How exactly would we make it happen in Burundi right now, tomorrow, or even in a year? Or the right to education for all? Eh? So resource constraints do exist. And as development people, we're quite good with it. And as policy makers too, but rights people have a hard time facing up to that reality. And in a post-conflict context, when the resource constraints are typically enormous and the needs are enormous, that leads to a sort of lack of legitimacy, I think, of talking about rights in the usual way. It, it makes rights people sound stupid or naive or simply indeed about high moral ground and nothing else. Governments typically don't appreciate work on rights-based approaches in post-conflict contexts. They might not have appreciated it before either, or during, but they surely don't do it actually afterwards either. I have never seen one that liked it. Um, 
you know, and again, even if they're not outright totalitarian governments or highly authoritarian governments, um, they just don't particularly like it. They, they, they want to have some time off without being criticized right away for things that they often consider that they are not really responsible for. Um, they are formal rebels often or formal, eh? or, or uh, who, who really um, are not exactly champions of human rights and that's not particularly the, the tool that brought them to power either. So it would be unlikely that suddenly overnight this becomes their prime concern. Um, they, they often uh, feel strongly that security is more important concern than, than rights in the short term and that, uh, that, that uh, strengthening their own control and power over the territory is the most important constraint. After all, the fact that there was a violent conflict precisely meant that there was not a clear full control over the territory. Uh, and so to most of them, having full control and establishing that for sure is absolutely primordial. Um, they, they are often suspicious, if not outright paranoid, about much outside criticism and so on. And so in that particular context, to start talking about rights-based approaches is almost guaranteed to lead to strong backlashes. Yeah. Um, Rwanda would be, of course, a, a perfect example thereof, but I think most situations are like that. So while on the one hand there is a space there, on the other hand, there is often violent counter-reaction from the powers that be, and you risk creating quite a lot of trouble for yourself, which often is not something you particularly desire.